No, I mean in the Bible. Where's that in the Bible? Uh, okay. <laughs> chapter 6. Ha ha ha! Yes, it's in the Old Testament? I found oh, it. Yeah. <coughs> what, what, give us a page number. 656. Uh, it's probably appropriate to go ahead and say who our winner is, isn't it? For our Bible? Is Miss Angela gone? Okay. Usually the style I'd have, but next time I go out in the rain or I go preach at camp or whatever, that's what I want to do. A lot of crime. What's that? A lot of crime while you're reading. Oh yeah, if you cry, it, I mean, you could just wipe it off. Yeah. We went out in the rain with it the other night. You guys saw it. Went out in the rain with it. Came inside, squeezed it, wiped it. Like new, except for the. Okay, so you guys know about this Bible. This Bible is an autographed by Dustin Duke version that he's willing to give up as a prize. And our prize winner with uh, two visitors. Those are two visitor prize winners. Is that Mr. Daniel? They brought two visitors. Okay, Daniel. Hey, all right. <laughs> So now you can use your very own Bible. Now listen, one of the reasons we like to give out Bibles is because we know what to do if you get into that thing. Wouldn't that be a precious book? If that's a book that you got to know and became your friend. I have some Bibles that I haven't been using every day for years. But I just can't let them go because we're friends. <laughs> and we just had so much time together. And, and uh, they've just become very dear and precious. The first Bible you read, front cover to back cover, the first Bible you really spent some time in. It's going to become a very special book to you just because it'll be the one that you just have all the memories with. It's sort of like when you've been places with somebody, you've been to some really special things and through some special things, and they become a close friend, and that's the way the Word of God will be for you. So congratulations on winning that, and look forward to seeing that in your hands. Bring it to church every time you come to church. So congratulations to you. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, and I want to look down to uh, verse... Verse 1, we're just going to read verse 3. We'll look at more than that tonight. But I want to talk to you guys this evening about a simple matter of courage. A matter of courage. And so, let's read verses 1 through 3. It pleased Darius, or Darius, to set over the kingdom in 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three, over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Well, let's pray. Father, this evening... Oh, we're, we're in our last message. You can come right on in and join us if you want to. Yeah. It's Josiah's mom. Thanks for loaning us your son. We're, we're nearly done. <clears throat> All right, let's pray. Father, I pray that as we look at this portion of the Scripture that you would encourage us and speak to our hearts. And God, I pray that you would instill in each of these men one of the crucial Christian uh, character traits of courage. And I just thank you so much for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, men, I just want to tell you, if there's anything that I respect in a person, more than anything else, it's just a matter of courage. Uh, courage is something that is today really a trait that deliberately has been taught out of the youth in our country. And I mean this. I mean literally courage is a trait that is deliberately uh, taught as something that's not, not the best way or not the right way. We have in the last year, uh, and I, I don't want to talk specifics of this, but we've been touched by the lack of courage in our schools in Broward County in this last year. We've been touched by it. Literally by people who don't have courage. And I have been amazed at just the coverage, the press, the responses that I've been hearing. I've been amazed at really the debate over courage. Whether it's the best thing for a person to sacrifice himself for the behalf or for the good of someone else. And man, I just want to tell you, it's a characteristic and it's, it's, this is a special audience here this evening because you're all men. And it's a special characteristic that ought to be one of the defining marks of manhood, of being a man. 
there's anything a man ought to be, I ought to be courageous. And a lack of courage actually is something that it's something that's destroying marriages. Honestly, there are so many marriages where I see a man isn't courageous, he's a coward. And because he will not have the courage to sacrifice himself or to do whatever is necessary for the best of his family, he doesn't have the trust of his wife. He doesn't have the respect of his children because he lacks courage. Now many of us, I think the word is a lofty word. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a gaming word. Maybe it's something that you, know, you understand from playing a video game or something. But really, courage uh, does not carry within it uh, a lack of fear. In other words, when we talk about a person being courageous, we're not saying a person's never afraid. Let's be honest about it. How many of us in this room have been fearful in our life? If you tell me you're not afraid of anything, all I'm going to say about you is you're a fool. You can put your hands down. If you tell me, Pastor, I'm not afraid of anything. I ain't afraid of nothing. I ain't afraid of nobody. i heard people like that before. And you tell me you're not afraid of anything, and all I'm going to tell you is that either you're not telling the truth or you don't have the common sense to know what's good for you. Mm. Being courageous does not mean that you're never fearful, but being courageous means, if we're just going to loosely define it in a way I think we can understand it, it means that in spite of fear we do what's right. In other words, courage really is the self-determination that regardless of the consequences, regardless of what happens to me, I'm afraid it's going to turn out badly, but I'm going to do it because it's right. Matter of fact, you know, uh, just deciding in your life, making a decision that you're going to do right, that is the precedent to becoming courageous. A person that says, you know what, I'm not going to always do the easy thing, I'm not always going to do the simple thing, I'm not always going to do the thing that I think will be best for me, but I'm always going to do the right thing, that's a step toward courage. And so we could define a courageous man as a man who in spite of fear, in spite of understanding that maybe the consequences for me will not be good, this is best, this is right, and I'll do the right thing. And so really it's a part of it still, it's a part of our character, isn't it? In other words, a person who has good biblical character is a person who does right no matter what the consequences. You know, a lot of times uh, people wait until they're faced with the moment of decision to determine what they're going to do, whether they're going to do right or wrong. Listen, listen to me, guys. There are things that you need to decide before you're ever faced with a decision. Let me just share some personal ones with you. For instance, my wife... I want, to, I want you guys to know this. My wife is the first girl I ever kissed, and the day I kissed her was on our wedding day. And I don't think I have any friends that can say the same thing, or I have very few if I do. I don't remember who they are. My wife is the first girl I ever kissed, and the first day I kissed her was on our wedding day because the Bible says, it, it says marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The Bible says that we're supposed to abstain from fornication. Brother, uh, Brother Duke alluded to that a little bit ago. He referred to that. You know, it takes some courage to do that. I used to listen to people that would say, you never kissed a girl. What, are you afraid? I wasn't afraid of kissing a girl. I was afraid to kiss a girl because of the consequences that would be ramifications in my life later on because I knew what the Bible said. Anybody can kiss a girl. Just sneak up on her. <laughs> I mean, it ain't that hard, right? Okay. I mean, it's like, what do you say? Well, if you, I mean, kiss her and run, kiss and run, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a courageous thing to take something that belongs only to the husband of a young lady. It's not courageous to take something that only belongs to one person and to steal it from them. A thief's a coward. Doesn't belong to me. It belongs to one person. I belong to one person. My wife belongs to one person. You say, Pastor, is it the end of the world if that ever happened? No, but it's something that you ought to get clear about. You ought to get clarity about. I asked our teenagers a while back a simple question. I said, You know, what would you all think if you all saw me kissing some lady that wasn't my wife? And the teenagers always said, Oh, that would be a terrible, Pastor. 
we'd think, you know, that'd be really bad. I said, well, what's the difference between you kissing someone that's not your wife and me kissing someone that's not your wife and they all say well, you're married? You ever think that all the way through? You ever think that all the way through? Just say, okay, what does being married have to do with an exclusive relationship? So if I'm not married, I can just behave in a way with someone the way I would with a married person just because we're not committed? We can act as though we are committed? Does that make it? Is that okay? So what's the difference between somebody who's not married being immoral and someone who's married being immoral? It's the moral difference. You'd think terribly of me what about yourselves. And so when I was a teenager, <laughs> I decided I wasn't going to get into a serious relationship with a girl until God showed me he was going to, that He wanted me to marry her. Just decided that. You know, a lot of people just don't think it's cool to see you do that. Now, I'm not going to say I was unpopular in high school. I wasn't. I'm not going to say I didn't hang out with guys that had different standards than me. I probably did. But I just want to tell you something. When they made fun of me for it, it hurt my feelings, but I did right. And that takes that's courage. That's an example of courage. Courage isn't just running in front of a bullet. Courage is doing what's best. Before I ever met my wife, I knew it would be best for her to have confidence in her husband. And so I did it for her. Before I ever met my wife, I knew it was best for me to honor and glorify God, and so I did it for him. Before I met my wife, I knew exactly what Brother Duke was talking about earlier. Thank you so much for that. I knew it was giving place to the devil. And so I resisted him. We've all had times when we haven't resisted the devil like we ought to. But man, I'll tell you something. You show courage in an area, and it'll pay dividends in your life. It's character to know what's right and to do it. Well, Duke said something I thought, man, he's so spot on about it earlier. He said, you know, you guys are going to see people passing drugs in front of you. You ever ask yourself the question why it is that somebody who's ruining their life doing drugs and drinking alcohol can't stand for you not to? You ever ask just a logical question. Why is a guy who's wrecking his life so bothered that I'm not? You meet a druggie, you meet somebody doing drugs, and they are not okay with you not doing drugs. I just want you to enjoy this. I just want you to know they want to just drag you down is what they want to do because you make them feel conviction. And because they feel conviction, they want to wreck your life so they'll feel better about their life. Listen, you guys need to hear this. You need to think about it. And it's going to take some courage to stand up to them because a lot of times they're going to be saying, I'm your friend. The hardest person in the world to stand up to is a friend and an enemy. Two groups. Uh... Samuel Clements, who wrote all the books under the moniker Mark Twain, uh, said something loosely to this effect. He said, We will do more to impress people that we cannot stand. We'll spend more, we will invest more, and we will go to greater lengths to impress people that we don't even like because we can't stand the thought of them despising us. Listen, people that are living for the devil, if they despise you, my friend, they tell you something. Don't try and impress them. Here, let me wreck my life so you'll think better of me. They don't even like you anyway. Somebody wants to wreck your life doesn't like you anyway. They don't care about you. They want to see you go down a path of destruction. The second benefit of courage is that if you'll have courage, you can help other people. Let me tell you something that happened. When I was 18 years old, I was struggling in, the, in, in my Christian walk just with things that I listened to. I had a lot of friends. Honestly, I'll be, be truthful with you, music was never very important to me. My dad was a professional musician. He had a, a rock band, a karaoke business, and a, lot, and, a bit, and a music store and so forth. And Music was really important to my dad, and I watched him struggle in the area of victory with it, so I always just thought, you know, I don't want to go through that, so I'm not going to go there. But my friends... Music really defined them. A lot of them, Christian, I'm talking about Christian friends, a lot of them would say things about their music this way. They would say, my music. You ever heard somebody say, my music? As though they're the producer, the recording artist, and they're the ones making all the money that you're spending on it, and they could somehow take response. It's not, it's not your music, it's their music, and uh, you're standing in line to imitate them, to dress like them, to emulate the stupid things they say and do. Listen, listen to the average song. Listen to the average rock song. Listen to the average rap song. Listen to the average... I'm not recommending you actually do, but I just think about the words. 
of the average pop music and listen to the words in it and ask yourself, is there anything in this that I want to describe me? It's all failure. It's all wicked. It's all despair. I mean, they sing about despair and you're going to make that your music? My life's a wreck. I know that that's probably not the actual song. Maybe I'll write it. My life's a wreck and here's why. And they sing about it and then that becomes your music. Is, is your life a wreck? Is, are you going to emulate that? Is that what you want? Not on your life, man. Not me. I, I struggled with that when I was a teenager. And I remember I got under great conviction about it one day because I was studying for the ministry and I wanted to lead young people. And I wanted to preach to adults and I knew I couldn't say one thing and do another. I couldn't say, you need to not listen to that. or that's not. I knew it wasn't good. I knew it wasn't right in spite of the arguments my friends would try to come up with. And so I decided I need to get victory of this. I need to be done with this. And I remember riding after church on Wednesday night. I was in uh, my friend. We had just built a 300ZX. Uh, a real nice, it was, a, it was like a, it was a 1980s version of a 300ZX. And it wasn't a 2 plus 2 where it has the tiny back seats. It was just a two-seater. And we had two girls riding with us. So there's two of us. And uh, then there's two girls, too. So there's four of us in a two-seater 200ZX. You say, Pastor, where were they sitting at? In the hatchback. <laughs> we had the girls in the hatchback. We had some dumb girls. Uh, <laughs> the, the girls dumb enough to ride around with two guys riding the hatchback. There were some desperate dumb girls. And uh, <laughs> I remember there were two girls in the hatchback. And my friend and I were pretty close friends. And we both loved the Lord. We both wanted to live for God. And we were really iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We tried to sharpen each other spiritually. But I remember he, he, uh, one of the girls reached up and turned his stereo on. She turned on some station. I don't remember what it was. I remember what it was playing. But uh, I said, you know, guys, I don't think we ought to listen to that. And I turned, we were all coming from church. We are all Christian kids. If I shouldn't listen to it, they shouldn't listen to it, right? So I turned it off. And the girl said some things about me. She called me some funny names about, uh, you know, <laughs> we never used this one. I always like the Billy Bible. You make fun of somebody because you call him Billy Bible. You know, Billy's always got his Bible. Or, you know, call him a Bible thumper. Now, I like Bible thumper. That's what I wear. I am a Bible thumper, actually. There is documented evidence of the fact that I thump people hard with Bibles. <laughs> and so, I'll take that one. That one, but, oh, Ryan, you're a little, little, little goody two-shoes and all this stuff, you know. And she said about me, and my friend, who was driving at the time, I was in the passenger seat, my friend was quiet. It was just silent for a few seconds. And he heard what she was saying about me, and we were friends, and it bothered him actually. The music didn't bother him, but it bothered him what she said to me. Because we were friends. And we were really friends. And he said, actually, I shouldn't be listening to it either. Just, that's all he said. He said, actually, I shouldn't be listening to it either. And she shot up. She didn't say anymore because she's thinking, yeah, and I shouldn't either. And the other girl's thinking, and neither should I. About a year later, I remember he was, we were, he was at my house, and he was talking to our mom, my mom, and my mom was teasing about me not being a good friend. He said, actually, Ryan's the best friend I've ever had. And he said, you know, there are some things I used to struggle with, and he said, just watching his example, just watching him have the courage to say something, he said, it's just changed my whole life. All I said was, I really can't listen to that, guys. I'm sorry. That's all I said. And it precipitated something that made him say, you know what? I can't either. It's amazing how contagious the right kind of courage actually is. Here in our text tonight, we see a man who has continually been promoted because of character. I mean, you ask the question, why was Daniel in three different kingdoms... I mean, kingdoms conquered, taken over, usually get rid of all of the government and set up a new one. How does a guy survive three governments and rise to the top of every one of them? Courage. He had courage to do right. I mean, he had, Daniel had character. I'll tell you something. Somebody who's in a high place, they know that there are a lot of people that get, their, to, get to where they get to by bribery, by treachery, by dishonesty. You know something you can bank on with somebody who will tell a lie to get somewhere? Is he'll tell you a lie to get somewhere. Somebody will turn on someone, turn against someone, and betray someone for his own gain, will betray you for his own gain. My friend, playing the no courage game makes you a spineless creature, and you're no kind of a friend, and you won't have any kind of friends being that way. And so now, uh, Darius, 
is king, and he sets up 120 governors over the different provinces. And over the 120 governors, he sets up. Uh, I'm sorry, he set he he set up three presidents. And of the three presidents, the number one president was Daniel. Daniel, the the number one guy in the entire kingdom, was Daniel. Daniel got to be president because of courage. When you're introduced, by the way, you guys want to read some fun part of the Bible? Go to Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 1. I'm telling you, that's, that is a place that influenced me as a youth. A reading about Daniel, who purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. And he literally risked his life when he said, I, I can't eat that diet to the prince of the eunuchs. What he said was something that if the prince of the eunuchs allowed him to do what he said, it meant the prince of the eunuchs would be killed and he'd be killed too. Literally, his decision to say, I cannot do that. It's not right, I cannot. By saying, I cannot, he's saying, I will not. It's not being a rebel. He's literally saying, I'd rather die than do the wrong thing. And he's a kid. And over and again, he and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we know their names, showed courage. They just said, I'm just going to do right. Well, here's another one. And here's an instance where Daniel's courage and determination to do right actually looks as though it's going to be his undoing. It looks as though it's going to be the thing that is the straw that breaks the camel's back, the time when courage didn't have good consequences. By the way, courageous people die. Do you know that? A courageous person can get killed while he's being courageous. I'd just rather die that way. Daniel said here, then the, or in verse 4, the Bible says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. They try to do what everybody does when you start to run. Uh, you guys probably don't watch as much news as I do. You might. But uh, there's a lady who's running for representative in Florida, and she's a Republican. And they, as soon as she began to run, they began to just just dig into her background. Nobody knew her. Nobody knew anything about her. They said, let's go find some dirt. Let's go find something as far back as we have to go. So they accused her of not being a college graduate. And she, I, it looks like, we don't know, but it looks like she lied and made up a diploma. She, she uh, printed, had a diploma printed, and they found out she went to school at that school for four years, but they didn't have the degree that she said she graduated with, and they, that school says she didn't graduate. Now, this story's not all finished yet, but that's what happens when you, when you especially if, you, if uh, you're against killing babies and you're against doing things that are immoral, and you take a stand for things, as people say, well, I'm going to find some dirt on you, and I'm going to dig it up. Well, they tried to find dirt on Daniel, and they couldn't find anything. I mean, they, they, the three presidents and princes, so you got 120 princes, you got uh, the two presidents, sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So they resort to treachery. Now, they're going to trick him. They're going to put him in a situation where there's no way he can do the right thing. They're going to put him in a situation where if he does this, he'll betray his character and what makes him what he is. Or if he does this, uh, then he'll be put to death for doing the thing that's not politically expedient. Guys, listen to me. A courageous man does what God says is right. He doesn't test the wind and find out what culture thinks. When I was growing up, there was no debate. Listen to me. When I was growing up, there was no debate about whether sexual sin was wrong. When men and women live together, and I'm not picking on anybody's family or anything. I know we all are related to, we all know people that do wrong. But when I was growing up, if a man or a woman lived together uh, without being married, we called that shacking up. And it didn't matter if you were a church person or not. It was wrong. You didn't live with somebody when you weren't married to them. I never met a man or woman who was in a homosexual lifestyle that anybody knew about until probably the 1990s. Now, you can snicker and you can laugh about it, but my friend, homosexuality was popular in the 1920s in our country. And people would come out of the closet, so to speak. But I'll tell you something. Sexual sin is sexual sin, whether it's between a man and a woman or two men or two women or whatever it is. Sin is sin. And trying to make it an issue of discrimination or whatever you want to call it, my friend, 
Sin is sin. When I was a kid, if you try to run on a platform of we're two men together, they're in a country, in the, they're in the state in the United States where anyone who had any kind of character would ever vote for you for anything, they'd say he's a degenerate, perverted individual. If a man lived with a woman that wasn't his wife and ran for office, they'd say, we'll never vote for him. He's not even faithful to his wife. Not even faithful enough to marry his wife. And that was just gen that was culture. If you went with the culture of the day, you'd be like a lot of our politicians today that 10 years ago said this is wrong and today they say this is wrong. When Barack Hussein Obama ran for office, one of the things he said he could never accept is homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. On his platform, one of the things he said, I'll never do. Yep. It's wrong. Marriage is between a man and a woman. God made it that way and I'll never accept it until he realized that there was some political capital in changing his opinion. Is that courage? Is it right or wrong? Does Barack Obama and the Supreme Court decide that, or does God decide that? See, courage says, I'm going to do what God says is right, and I don't care whether hey, everybody's with me or everybody's against me. Listen to me. You do the right thing, and there will be a time when some people are with you, and you do the right thing, and there will be a time when even the same people will be against you. I've stood for right many times in my life, and I've watched people that I know agree with me just be silent and not say a word. Ah, uh, you know, that's just, uh, it's not worth it. I don't want to fight that fight. I don't want to. They lack courage. I have the same people that say, you know, somebody's got to do something. Get me to do something, and then I watch it. Where are you guys at? Where's. Pastor, somebody needs to say something. I say something, and then people said somebody needs to say something. Wait, and they agree. <laughs> Where'd you guys go? Hey, guys, where are you? I tell you, courage does not put the finger in the wind, figure out which direction the wind's going, and try to try to sail with it. Courage says what's right, and just stick with that. I'm gonna tell you, you can be called a lot of names if you're courageous. You'll be called a bigot. You'll be called. Uh, you'll be called all kinds of things except for what you actually are. Nope. Courageous. What? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, dolt. Thank you. Thanks for the word. Anthony knows what dolt means. If anyone else needs to know, he can give you the definition of it later on. He can also tell you what a buffoon is. He can tell you what zany means and some other things as well. All right. Here's what the guys did. They conspired against Daniel. And here's they went to the king and they got him to say this. They said, King Darius, this is the second part of verse 6, live forever. All the princes, presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast in the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed. I just read that. Wherefore, King Darius, sign the writing and the decree. Here's the thing they figured out about Daniel. Daniel gets on his knees and he prays to God every day. And he does it in front of an open window and he doesn't care who sees him. Everybody knows that's what Daniel does. They say, well, let's get him on something he always does. If we can't get him on something he does wrong, let's make something he does wrong. And so they talked to Darius, the king, or Darius, however you'd like to pronounce it. They said, King, let's, let's make a rule for this space of time. If anybody asks anybody but you for anything, we want you to be the supreme being of the universe. And let's just make it so that no one asks a petition or request or prayer from anybody but you for this space of time. Because they knew Daniel asked God for things every day. And so... Darius thought, well, that'd be nice. Have people pray to me, bow to me, ask me. He signed. He loved Daniel. He was going to set Daniel. Daniel was going to be the guy that was in charge of everything. It was going to be just like Joseph was with Pharaoh in Egypt, where the king didn't do anything. He was just the king, but Daniel did everything because he trusted him so much. So the king signs the decree, and let's look what Daniel does. What do you think Daniel's going to do? Pray. It's illegal to pray. What's he going to do? Pray. pray. He's going to pray. Why is Daniel going to pray? Right. Because it's the right thing to do. It's what he's always done. It's always been right. It's always going to be right. You know what's nice about being courageous? Listen to me right now. I'm going to tell you something really funny. 
And in a couple years, if you'll remember I said this, you'll laugh to yourself in a couple years. Okay? When you're a teenager, one of the things that you know for a fact is that adults don't really get a lot of things culturally, right? I mean, they don't really know, like, how things really are. Isn't it true? I mean, you, your parents, I mean, they're nice people, they're smart people, but they have never really been with it. It's true, isn't it? I mean, they've never been cool the same way you are. They've never really understood the way teenagers are and the way things work the way you do. Isn't it true? Now, here's the funny thing is when you get old, you're going to be the parents. Kids are going to think exactly that. How many of us, how many adults here thought that when you were teenagers? Yeah. Parents don't, I mean, parents just don't get it. They just don't know anything. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of friends that say, you know, the older I get, the more the smarter my uh, dad gets. Like, I just didn't, had no idea. I'm finding out my dad's so smart. I tell Anthony this all the time. Anthony, you would be amazed at the things I could teach you if you believed I knew anything. You know, if you just thought I knew something, I could just teach you some amazing things. But, you know, it's like, go ahead and go mess that up. When we get done, I'll show you how to do it. But, you know, that's, that's just the way we are when we're teenagers. I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm a long ways from it. But when you get older, you're going to laugh your head off when you hear a teenager. You'll be like, Mom, Dad, you just don't understand. They'll be like, you just don't understand. <laughs> you know, your parents understand. They just know what's right and what's wrong. And they probably, I hate to say it, but they just know better than you do. That's all it is to it. And if you try to stay with the times, you're going to look like my parents in their wedding picture. <laughs> I still laugh at my parents' wedding picture. My parents grew up, my parents got married, what, in 1973? And that was four years after 1969. My dad was born in 1950, and so he grew up right in the heart of the 1960s. And so platform shoes, bell-bottom pants, mm -hmm. and long sideburns, and the goofy, shaggy hair. And uh, my mom's wedding picture, she's got a floppy hat, like a really <laughs> floppy hat. And uh, a white, and it, every time when I was growing up, my dad's tuxedo had that wide, like the really wide lapel, yeah. and a big old flowery deal down the front, and a big old cummerbund, and you know, and he's got these glasses like some of y'all wear now, I think like Mr. Charlie's glasses. Uh, and he's got like this just, and you just look at it, and his kids, we just, he all, like were you all just dressing up? Were you just being silly? Like, did you, no, that, no, that was just actually the, the latest, greatest, coolest thing when they were growing up. And so that, they were just, they were just on top of the trends. You know something? They hadn't been on top of the trends in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> it's never come back. <laughs> Bell bottoms came back for a while in the 1990s, but they were really coming back as a joke more than anything else. Y'all skinny pants people. I'm sorry. Someday your children are going to mock you mercilessly. Don't ever document your pants. I'm just telling you, men wearing, wearing women's pants, don't you take a picture of those things. Don't you ever, don't you ever let anybody document that because you will be humiliated when you're, when you're an adult. That's a fact. I was telling you, you think you, I, I look at you skinny pants people, and I'm just like, guys, you have no idea what you're gonna. You have no idea. You just don't know. The sag pants, I, those things have never really gone away. No. The, 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 I thought just for sure. Around. I just, yeah. <laughs> I thought that'd go away, but it doesn't. But I'm just going to tell you something. Someday, someday, these pants that, that you uh, you work so hard to squeeze yourself into, are, they're going to be the embarrassment of your life. You just your kids are going to say, "Mom and Dad, don't try to tell me anything about fashion. You wore skinny pants." <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that'll be the silencer. You won't have a word to say at that time. You're just going to be like, yeah, I did. <laughs> so, my point is this. I'm not trying. I am picking on your on your styles just a little bit because that's what, it's the only thing I can do. You don't think I'm stylish, so I'm going to pick on your styles and get back at you. All right? And someday, someday, it's going to hit you. Right now, you're like, oh, Pastor just doesn't know how cool skinny pants are. No, someday, you're going to look at your pictures and somebody else is going to be there and like... <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be like, oh, Pastor Price is right. <laughs> this is going to be the worst ever. <laughs> so, let's tell you that. Okay, that's fashion and that's so forth. I'll just tell you guys, you want to, you want to be fashionable? You want to be fashionable? You can't, because the fashions will change. 
If you're with it right now and you have the latest and greatest in fashion, in a couple of years, you're not going to be fashionable anymore. Matter of fact, after, after buying new clothes over and over and again, you're going to be like, I'm not going to be fashionable anymore. <clears throat> I'm not going to do it. I'm going to pick something that's just the same. It's not fashionable. It's just, it's just professional. And you'll go with that. Because you just can't stay with every trend. You can't change. And guys, listen to me. This is the most important part. You can't change right and wrong. Right and wrong doesn't change with the trends of the day. Trends come, trends go. I promise you, if there's an awakening in our country, the moral values in our country are going to change. It looks as though we're on a tide of change. We might, we might, you guys pray for this, in your lifetime we might see the murder of babies banned in our country. What nonsense to call murdering babies protecting women's rights. You think about that. Use your brain sometime instead of listening to rhetoric and think about how murdering an innocent baby is protecting a mother's right. And we might see that abolished in our country in the next couple of years. It might, it might happen. Will you pray for that? And you think about it. You think hard because, because I'm, the one, I'm the one that has to deal with women and men who are dealing with the scars of murdering their own children. And I'm telling you something. God's not neutral on it. God hates it. And we might see it. We might see it in our country someday. But you know whether we do or not, it's wrong. You have courage, you'll stand up and you'll, you'll, you'll protect some man. You could save somebody's life by telling someone the truth. By having the courage to say, don't kill your baby. Please don't kill your baby. It'll ruin your life. It'll, it'll, it won't just murder your baby, but it, you're, you'll never be the same afterwards. You'll be having nightmares. You'll, you, you'll go to bed, everything's normal, and you'll wake up in the middle of the night crying. And it'll never go away. It'll never be the same. Don't kill your baby. I listen. We, 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 we have so many people that I know that could tell you from experience. You have courage. You save some people. You help some people with some things. You do right. Now Daniel knew that the writing was signed. When Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went to his house. And his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. I'm going to tell you the last thing I want to say about courage tonight. Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. God protected him. And then the men that plotted and schemed actually got what was coming to them. That's how the story ended. Because God's good. And God will take care of you. I just love the way the Bible says this. It does not say Daniel agonized for hours wondering what he should do. When this unjust decree was made, he said, I will forego praying until this matter is settled. And I'm going to do whatever is necessary to be able to honor the king and honor God. No, Daniel had already decided a long time ago that he was going to honor God. And if honoring the king meant dishonoring God, there was no debate. There's no question of agonizing over what to do because he'd already decided what he's going to do. He's not going to defile himself. Now, if it's right to pray on Monday, it's right to pray on Tuesday. And if it's right to pray this year, it's right to pray next year. If it's right, it'll always be right. And so Daniel just did right. That's all he did. That's all he had to do. You know what God did? God honored him. We were singing the Daniel song the other day, weren't we? Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Okay. All right. All right, you got to slip out just saying. All right, we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, honor them, a faithful few, and hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Thank you so much. Thanks for bringing him. And men, you've been challenged with some things. What about reading your Bible? Get a Bible. And what? Read it. And then we said, uh, be a hearer and a doer. Read it and do it. Obey it. Read it and obey it. We've looked at a lot of things. We looked at uh, preaching and sharing the gospel with your friends, and being a testimony to your friends. We talked about uh, making decisions or understanding that, excuse me, that the Satan, the devil, is your enemy and he wants to hurt you, and he wants to hurt your possessions, and he wants to hurt the people you love, and he wants to hurt you. 
You made the decisions. You know some things. We talked about specifics. Alcohol. Drugs. Immorality. Hey, going to church, being faithful to God. Is there a debate about what's right? Do we have to decide whether or not it's right or wrong? Well, if we decide it's right, what are we going to do? Everyone has to drink alcohol tomorrow. You can't keep your job unless you go to this activity and we're all going to test this wine. It's a no-brainer for me, folks. I don't have to decide about that. You might lose your job if you... I don't have to decide. Listen, when I was in high school, I couldn't work at the Dillon's grocery store because I'd have had to sell liquor. I wouldn't do it. I'd have had to sell cigarettes. I wouldn't do it. Can't work that job. Not going to do it. If it's wrong for me, it's wrong for someone else. I won't participate in that. Never had to decide about that. And I never had to be a lame cashier and wear the stupid apron either. There's some benefits of courage. You don't lose your manliness over it. <laughs> Guys, God can just take care of you. You don't have to ever do wrong. It's never right to do wrong in order to do right. It's an old saying. That is true. And if it's right today, it'll be right tomorrow. People change, times change, trends change. You guys are laughing. I know you're smirking and you're going to go home and say, Pastor Price thinks homosexuality is a sin. Listen, I want to tell you something. When I was a kid, there was no debate about that. And if a man had stood up in front of people with the Word of God and claimed that there was, he'd have been in the newspaper for it. He'd have been on TV. I'm telling you, you'd have made the news. You'd have been run out of every town in this nation if you'd have been a preacher and tried to say that fornication and sexual sin is okay. Used to be the trend. Now guess what? If you all wanted to, you could take a copy of this video and you could give it to the right people and they put me on the news. And you know how much I'd care? I ain't scared of that. Right's right, wrong's wrong. Isn't it so? I'm not trying to be obnoxious. I don't hate anybody. I've won more homosexuals than probably anybody I know to Jesus. I have people that that love me and know I care about them that are in those sinful lifestyles because they know I care about them. I don't hate people. I'm not a bigot. I'm a gospel preacher and truth is truth. Mm. And if somebody's in, in a lifestyle that's wrecking and destroying them, you know who they need for a friend? Someone will tell them the truth. Not somebody will tell you, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just wrong for you. Or you can be happy and do that. It's a lie. Nobody happy in those lifestyles. There's nobody happy that's an alcoholic or a drug addict. They're not happy. Their lives are wrecked by it and they need to know it's sin. If they just start by not saying it's a sickness or an addiction or a disease and just call it sin, they'd be pretty close to being helped by it. But we try to say there's nothing wrong with it and then if there's nothing wrong with it, then why is it a problem? Why can't I get drunk and beat my wife if there's nothing wrong with it? Well, it's just what it does to you. No, my friend, it's just what it does to everybody. It's just wrong. That's all. And it's the truth. And we need some men to have courage. How about when you go to school, instead of buying and believing rhetoric, how about thinking? People say, hey, let's all walk out. And you say, well, let me think about it. What are we walking out for? Everybody walked out last year. Remember that? Everybody walked out. Y'all remember what you walked out for? Yeah. Somebody tell me, what for? What you walk out for? Gang gun guns violence. Y'all know some violent guns? Let's talk about it. Y'all know some y'all ever met a gun that just like cursed you out and <laughs> punched you in the nose? Y'all ever met violent guns? Huh? AK forty seven, what do they say? Guns an inanimate object. Why don't we have knife violence? Why don't we have baseball bat violence? Why don't we have automotive violence? When we have throwing people off bridges violence. Who's walking out of, out of school because that girl was thrown off a bridge last week? They were all getting ready to jump off a bridge and she decided she didn't want to jump. They pushed her off, broke three ribs. She's in the hospital. When we walk out of school? There was no school. When we just stop swimming? They got swimming pools at y'all's school. I'm just saying, let's think a little bit. You see, you see what I'm saying? 
How about having the courage to say, before I do something, let me figure out what's right or wrong. Guns are violent. Everybody walks out. Let's take all the guns away from our military. Should we do that? You think our military should go to battle without guns? Are guns violent? People are violent, right? Do violent people figure out a way to be violent with or without guns? Brains, guys. Your brains. A woman ought to have the right to protect her body. She ought to have the right to do what she wants to with her body. Listen, when there's somebody else's body inside of you, one person's right does not give them the right to violate another person's right. Isn't it so? Listen, you know, Tim Tebow is one of the most hated athletes in the United States. You know why he's hated? Because he got up in front of a bunch of people and said, I'm glad that when the doctors told my mother that it would be safer for her to abort me, that she decided to, to protect my life. And he is, he is a menace to society today for saying, I'm glad my mom didn't murder me. You got y'all glad your moms didn't murder you? Mm -hmm. I know your phone's ringing. We'll finish up. And so, guys, what we need is some men that have some courage. We need some guys that say, let me think about that. Let me figure out what's right or wrong. You know, there's a bunch of brainless mobs out there. They want to get out of class, so they'll walk out. Hey, listen, if it's right to walk out, go ahead. But you better know it's right, don't you think? If this is the right thing to do, go ahead. If this will do something about it, if this is what the Bible says this is the way to respond, then do it. And don't be afraid of the consequences. But you better know what right is. And see, if you determine what right is before you're ever faced with it, then guys, if you get in a situation a girl says, let's do this, and you say, you know something, I wouldn't do that to you. Not for anything. I'm, I'm a man. A man protects a woman, doesn't take advantage of her. I'll do, I'm going to do right by you. I'm going to be the only person in the world that never takes advantage of you, and you're going to know I'm your friend. That's a man right there. And that's the kind of gal your wife should have, or kind of guy your wife should have, isn't it? Your wife needs a man for a husband, a man that will take care of her, and that will do right by her. You know, I, don't, I don't care what it does to me. I'm going to do right. I don't care what I have to sacrifice or give up. I'm going to do right. Courage. Courage. No, you just simply say courage is that part of character that determines that I'm going to just do right. And, I'm, and it's not because I'm not afraid. Believe it or not, I don't enjoy being unpopular. I don't. Uh, when somebody gets really angry at me for, and they're unreasonable about it, I'm able to find humor in it sometimes. I'm able to laugh sometimes, but deep down it hurts me. I don't like to be unpopular. And you know something, if you're courageous and you do right, people are going to be like, well, you know, I don't like the way he said that. Or, you know, the, the one that, that cracks me up. It isn't what you said, it's how you said it. Mm -hmm. Think about that sometime. Mm -hmm. It isn't what you said, it's how you said it. Eh, that's nonsense. It's what you said. It isn't how you said it. Because you couldn't have said it anyway to make it okay. Because they didn't like the message. Therefore, they don't like how it was delivered. All right, guys. I just want to share my heart with you as we finish and just say this. I'm thrilled to death that God's given us a man that will sit up straight, look you in the eye, and consider truth. And I consider you to be those kind of men. And because of that, I'm pretty confident when I'm a feeble old man that there are going to be some strong men that will take leadership and do right. I'm praying to God will be you guys, you men. Mm -hmm. God's doing a work. I'm seeing teenagers turning to Jesus and standing up, and they're saying, I don't care what anybody did before us. I'm going to do right myself. And I'm encouraged by it. And so I'm praying for you. And if I can be a help to you, and if you need to know Bible answers or have guidance for things, I'm available. That's what pastor does. You say, Pastor, I'm not clear about this. I don't know what's right. I'm going to do right. I just don't know what it is. Well, I'll help you with that. And I won't tell you what I think you should do. I'll tell you what the Bible says. And then you can know what's right, and you can do it. And you can be courageous. How many of y'all want to be courageous men? Yeah. See, I raised my hand without my eyes closed. and say, I want to be a man. I want to be courageous. Thank God for you. God, thank you for these men. And I just ask that you would help them to live and to practice all these great messages they've heard from Brother Duke this, this uh, last couple of days. And I pray that you'd help them be a man of great courage. God, as a school year starts, and they're immediately inundated, with not only temptation, but just distractions in life that keep them from being able to focus on being, really, living for your glory. I pray that you'd protect and help, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Duke, uh, you're in trouble.
Woo-hoo. Uh, you got to pick. You got. You got to pick uh, four guys. Four guys. Yeah. No, six guys. I'm sorry. Not one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, we had six services, and you got to pick six people. <laughs> Woo. Or you actually got to pick three. I'll do three. All right. You got to pick three people to get the curiously strong altoids. How many y'all have already gotten curiously strong altoids? All right, we'll eliminate you. <laughs> you already got some? Okay, we'll That's eliminate cool. you from the possibility of it. Who's actually not going to pick? The guys okay. who raise their hands. It's okay. not too bad. <laughs> Jose! Oh, Jose! <laughs> All right. You're doing pretty good, right? <laughs> got to have one more. Here. Charles, you got one? No. Charles? All right. And, oh, man. Man, you get one? Yeah. There we go. Everybody else? Except for Fuji. All right, guys. And Fuji was just goofing off so much, I just, I didn't give it to you. I mean, he had that goofy sticker, and he said, okay, guys, we're gonna, I'm going to go grab the uh, bus. We're going to load up. I know your parents are calling and be like, man, what kind of church do you go to at 9 in the morning and then not come back until 10 o'clock at night? Well, this kind of church. Uh, listen, we have church every single Sunday, but it doesn't go this long. And you can go home in the afternoon as well. You guys be in church. Amen. Okay, yeah. but this is something a little special, and it's really just for you. Hey, let's go ahead and uh, before we we're, while we're leaving, make sure to go by and let Brother Duke and Mrs. Duke know how grateful you are that they came and invested their lives in us uh, this last week. We are really thankful for you guys, and we just couldn't have got anybody that preached to us better or served us better. So we really are thankful for that. So you're dismissed, and I'm gonna go get the bus. <coughs> Hey, it's good to meet you guys. Thank you.